Good day, my fellow wealth hackers. This is Erwin Cito bringing you the truth about real estate investing, lockdown or no lockdown. <laughs> I trust you're all staying focused and controlling on focused on controlling what you can't control. Personally, I find getting angry about stuff I can't control, like government lockdowns and politics, a waste of energy. Uh, I still do read about current events from sele- from uh, selected resources. I don't read from the far left or the far right. I just don't have that much time, uh, and so I'll read all the non-sensationalist stuff. Uh, for example, I had a friend send me an article titled Martial Law in Quebec. Uh, so keep in mind, I didn't learn English as my first language. I learned English as my second language. Uh, so even I knew that the headline was incorrect because I just took the seconds to just go Google it. Uh, and uh, when police are not under the orders of the military, uh, then that's not martial law. They're the police are acting under the uh, orders of an elected government. So never forget, the media is there to get your attention. The more attention of yours you give, the more advertising space they can sell. I know, because I am a marketer. I have experience creating and running Facebook and Instagram ads. Anyways, I personally revisit my goals pretty much every week as I'm planning out my week. Uh, I, I use what's called a... One second. I actually stole this from Cherry because she was using it herself after the recommendation of a friend, uh, another successful entrepreneur. It's called a self journal. So it's uh, very excellent in my opinion. Uh, you know, you write down your goals and then you break them down and then you break them down even more into like weekly and t- weekly and then uh, by day by day and then into your schedule hour by hour. Anyways, uh, yeah. So. I'm focused on my goals and I'll continue to push my business and investing forward, continue to support our community and enable more and more hardworking Canadians to have create and have multiple six figure side hustles. Uh, for example, I'm still doing free stock hacking, free stock hacking demonstrations. Just last week we had over 500 people register. Uh, uh, but thankfully they didn't all show up because zoom caps out at 50. <laughs> uh, lockdowns won't hinder my ability to stock hack. If anything, it actually helps. Uh, I made 9% in both my accounts last week. And last week, we also closed on uh, refinancing three of our investment properties. Uh, we're paying under 3% interest rate, uh, which to me is almost free money. We're taking a bunch of capital out uh, from those properties and depositing them directly to my uh, to our corporate stock hacking account. We've also moved uh, those same properties from being uh, personally owned uh, to our corporation which frees up our personal credit for more mortgages. So now we can go buy more property. Uh, Financially, I have no complaints. I imagine many of your listeners also have no complaints. If you do have complaints, you know where to find me. I'm not really hard to find. Uh, If you do have complaints, hopefully you've been listening to this show for longer because we've been, to be honest, we've been handing out a lot of gold and the path to success is, uh, it's (laughs) well-traveled. If you listen to this show, you'll know it's well-traveled. It's not hard to reproduce what our guests do. Uh, Our guests are special in their success, but if you ask them, anyone can do it. It's just, it really comes down to who wants it enough. Uh, So hopefully you all have no financial complaints uh, and you're hopefully you're doing both things that we talk about a lot on this show, real estate to build wealth, stock hacking for cash flow. Again, folks, I'm not looking to brag or impress anyone. I'm simply sharing, uh, because this is the truth about real estate investing, I'm sharing the truths of my own stock hacking so that to express to you what a game changer this skill is. Uh, So over the last four weeks, I've cash flowed over 20,000 US between our our two accounts, which is what, and the bankroll is about equivalent to owning two houses. Um, So again, not looking to brag, this is just a reality. And also understand like those last four weeks included the last week of December. So I was realizing a whole bunch of losses for for tax harvesting reasons not 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 advice folks this is just historical facts <laughs> so anyways uh so if you're interested in real estate investing if you're new to this for free training or if you're for free training the number one investment strategy for real estate go to www.investortraining.ca my team is there to teach you how i personally invest how our clients uh, are investing uh, for to maximize property to maximize your returns uh, investortraining.ca to learn how to stock hack we're going to be sharing how joel uh, joel arndt who is the number one downloaded po- podcast of my of the show in 2020 
uh, we're going to be sharing his story on how he managed to stock hack and earn 4% cash flow per month. Uh, go to stockhackeracademy.ca slash demo for that to register. Don't delay because again, we almost ran out of space last time. www.stockhackeracademy.ca slash demo. On to this week's show. Uh, our old friend Kathleen Vandenberg, who has an alphabet after her name. Uh, she's an MBA, a CLU, a CFP. I think she's great because she's one of the few certified financial planners who recommends owning real estate. And she owns a fair amount of real estate herself, uh, 14 properties to be exact, including many duplexes and a recent flip. <laughs> I invited Kathleen to return to the show, asking her to share what lessons she's learned from 2020 and that she's sharing with her financial planning clients. Uh, so here's Kathleen's bio. Uh, think of this as if Kathleen's reading it. I have the best job in the world, and I have a lot of ton, ton of fun doing it. I specialize in working with individuals and families to improve their monthly cash flow and build significantly greater wealth compared to their current approach. Unlike other wealth strategists, I include real estate strategies as one of my six key components in clients' wealth building plans. I implement a six-step wealth strategy system with clients and routinely, routinely am able to create an over an over a million dollars of an additional income in retirement. Um, yeah, you want to hear from Kathleen. So without further ado, Kathleen Vandenberg. Hello, Kathleen. Hello. It's keeping you busy these days. Oh, wow. Um, trying to get my skiing back. I've got one property I'm finishing up for a friend. Uh, doing lots of uh, wealth insurance stuff. Uh, and of course, the stock hacking has been phenomenal. <laughs> That's sort of where my focus has been. I don't know if it's just because I love it so much, but it's been, yeah, a huge success. Game changer. Okay, so I used to nickname you the the the, uh, the real estate CFP. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the backstory around, generally CFPs do not recommend real estate. No. You were the first and one of the very few that do. You were almost always bullish real estate. And yeah, um, yeah, I've always been. I mean, my background is before I became a financial planner, I, I worked in mutual for, for mutual fund companies mm -hmm. in sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. And I just saw they weren't getting anybody anywhere. Like that was that whole lost decade. And I just didn't see how people could retire on RSPs. They just can't. So when I became a planner myself, I mean, obviously, ethically, I wanted to be helping people do what I was doing. I couldn't ethically sell them funds when I was all my money was going into real estate. So yeah, it's been a game changer for my clients to help them get real estate for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How long have you been investing in real estate? Since about 2008. That's a good time to pick it up. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, <laughs> it was one of the biggest crashes. Uh, my company had moved me to Calgary and then they packaged me out. So now I'm jobless homeless or moved back to Ontario. And I just was like, never again do I want to be at the mercy of, of a company, of an employer. And that's when we bought uh, a triplex and we lived in one of the units because, uh, well, we were, I'm 40 at this point living in my parents' basement and mm. somebody was going to die. I wasn't sure if it was going to be my husband or my father, but I knew that somebody was going to kill somebody. And that's how we got into it. So, and that was sort of what started our path and it's been a huge success. So it was a forced path how you started. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was a forced path, which is the case for many people, right? Situation dictates, I mean, in the back of everyone's mind, they've, they've known that real estate has been uh, a great place to invest. It's For most people, it's been their best financial decision that they've ever made. Mm -hmm. But they often don't go into investing or full-time investing until their hand is forced. Mm -hmm. So I think... If people can get into it sooner, then mm -hmm. they'll be way better off. But it's just like self-employment. People don't do it until they lose their job and they're forced to be right. innovative, right? Because companies have that golden handcuff to you. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I've seen, I, I, can, I can name off numerous times where someone's loss of employment resulted in something better for that person. Most times it does. Most times it does. People are smart. They're they're innovative. They they see opportunities and that constant paycheck I think stops them from taking that because mm -hmm. it takes it's a little bit more risk to go on your own or mm -hmm. but yeah, even if it's just a better job, mm -hmm. I get it. I think it was Rich Dad Poor Dad I kind of split that switch for me in my head was uh something along the lines of if you're talented, you either make money for yourself or you make someone else rich. Right. 
I was like, oh, that's kind of inefficient if I stay at this job. <laughs> and if you're not talented, you work for the government? I don't know. <laughs> I can't blame them. You know, coming through, the, you know, <laughs> last time we talked was, what, February, March? Right, right, when uh, the, the crash had happened. Yeah, you yeah. know, everyone with a pension and a government job is looking pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. There are times, you know, it's, it's a safe route, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Before we were recording, you were talking about one of your relatives that works for a city, you know, and they're all working from home. Yep. They're still getting paid. They still got their pension. Yep. And that's not a bad place to be. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it's safe job security. Yeah, mm-hmm. my sister works for the town of Pickering. Mm-hmm. So, good job. Yeah, it could be worse. It could be worse. Now, let's fast forward a bit to today. I had trouble keeping up. I thought you had 11 properties. You've since corrected me. <laughs> yes, we have uh, We have 14 now. We had bought a flip project in Peterborough mm-hmm. that I ended up keeping. Mm-hmm. because, uh, well, we listed it March 5th. I finished it up. We bought it in November, listed it March 5th. And then, of course, the the crapper had hit the fan. Mm-hmm. And uh, March 12th, we were holding back offers to March 12th, and that's exactly, I think, the date that they closed the schools and shut everything down. <laughs> so nobody was going to go see it. So uh, I quickly transitioned and rented it out and got a mortgage on it. I had a private mortgage on it because mm-hmm. when I bought it, it had no washroom, no furnace, no plumbing, no ductwork, no mm-hmm. water heater, anything. So I had a private mortgage on it. And I was, I mean, I should have made $100,000 on that flip. And mm-hmm. it was really what I had poured all my money, time and effort into. But thank goodness I had a backup plan. Peterborough has, you know, less than 1% vacancy rate at the time. And so, yeah, so we transitioned. I'll still sell that property when the current renters exit, but I'm glad I had a backup plan for it for sure. Right. It sounds like you bought smart then. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing about flipping is I've always said, if the market changes, it's no longer going to be profitable. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. at least I could be paid to keep it. Right. Because I remember you're talking about like 2008, for example, I had a friend who hired a contractor who was flipping properties in Brattle Path in <laughs> yeah. Toronto. Yeah. So then when he, he got stuck holding the bag. Right. Of the most expensive piece of real estate in the city. Right. How do you think that worked out for him? Yeah. Even if he did rent it out. Yeah, your negative cash flow and right. that eats away at your savings real fast. Right. So you always have to have a backup plan, I think, right. with flipping. And I imagine you bought smart as well. This was a starter home. This wasn't the yeah, it was, nicest house in the na- in the city. Yeah, it was a starter <laughs> home. I forget what I paid for it. I think it was like two twenty five, but it was right. a shell of a place. And I spent over a hundred thousand uh, renovating it. So and the plan was to sell it for around four fifty. So there's profit in there. It's just didn't come to me this year. So hopefully next year. Was it hard to find a tenant during a pandemic? No, it wasn't at all. It's a single family home, which is new for me. I'm more focused on duplexes. Mm -hmm. So the interest in a nice single family home was tremendous Mm -hmm. up in Peterborough anyway. So the property cash flows a $1,000 a month to me. But the reason why it cash flows is because I I have such a low mortgage. Mm -hmm. If I had 80% loan to value, then it wouldn't cash flow. But it wouldn't cash flow, right? No. no. And this seems to be commonality on our guests. What properties they, they flip are usually single families. Absolutely. Yeah. No interest in ever doing a duplex and then flipping it? Um, I I'm, am actually interested in doing that at this point because I've sort of, I feel like I've kind of hit my max in terms of properties that I want to own, just max in terms of properties that I can manage. Mm-hmm. So I either need to bring on a, a property manager if I want to continue to grow mm-hmm. or I'll sell a property if I buy another property. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. But if I was going to flip a, a property, my affinity is definitely towards doing a duplex because if the market changes or if I can't sell it right away, I can be paid to wait. It will cash flow. Mm-hmm. So, And that's sort of my area of expertise. So that's where I would focus is mm-hmm. on a property that I could duplex. Mm-hmm. This Peter River one just happened that I couldn't duplex it because it's slightly on the floodplain. Oh. But anyway, it'll work out. That's interesting because where did I hear at Brantford? Because Brantford's a great city for duplex, for example. Yep. But the city won't let you do it if it's in the floodplain. Same with Peterborough. Right. Well, just smart. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) In my opinion, just smart. Because, man, we had an awful, awful flood about two years ago. And we had one of these crazy ice melts. And so, like, the floodplain, like, the military was evacuating people. From floodplain. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, Peterborough's had some bad floods too. Mm. So folks, make sure you're investing smartly. <laughs> Keep those things in mind. Floodplains, 
do your own research. Well, that's why you want to work with an investor-focused realtor that knows the area because right, they'll right. know the ins and outs. They'll know about student areas, student mm-hmm. licensing, what, mm-hmm. what areas you can duplex, what the bylaws are for parking, what the bylaws are for uh, lawn coverage. Mm-hmm. These are all the, the things that you need to that you rely on your investor-based realtor for. Mm-hmm. Because if you buy wrong, gosh, that could be a really bad mistake. That's the funny thing is that most investor, pretty much every investor realtor I know doesn't charge any different than a vanilla realtor does. No. And the cost of getting it wrong is really bad. Yes. Yes, it is. Right. Imagine someone bought a house in the, fl- like, say, in the house that you bought. Right. Their numbers only worked if they duplexed it. Right. Right. And then they find out and then they can't do it or they do do it and then the insurance won't cover it. Hey, this is really expensive. Or it's not legal. <laughs> or it's not legal. Something happens. Because if the neighbor if the neighbor complains, then you have to exit out that right. basement tenant, and now your your incomes you spend all that money, right. and that income is just is not going to be there. So, right and to me, the it's the, my mind always goes to the worst case scenario. What if someone gets hurt in a fire? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, even if you aren't legal, you better have be honest with your insurance company mm-hmm. so that it's covered. So, and yeah. have good liability protection yeah. for sure. That's probably won't stop your name from being in the newspaper. <laughs> no, it will not. No. <laughs> yeah. Folks, get be on the up and up. Do you want to give a shout out to your realtor? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've had uh, a few realtors because I have so many great realtor connections, but mm-hmm. Anita Bongers Lewis has been one of my great ones out in uh, in Durham. There's some other great ones. Uh, Rob Brake is uh, another good one. Gene Lavadan I've used quite a bit as well. Awesome. I've been trying to get Rob Brake on the show forever. Yeah. Yeah. He's too, I think he's too busy doing real estate. He doesn't have time to podcast. <laughs> I think he actually has a podcast. So maybe you guys should do I've a pod- podcast and cross uh, publish it. <laughs> it's different. It's hard though. when Because uh, I've had that happen where people are just like being uh, polite and they're asking me questions on my own show. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> people aren't tuning in to listen to me. And, uh, and as I mentioned, our listenership has doubled. So we have about 16 listeners now. So we do have to backtrack some of the stuff we've already covered before in past episodes. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. So I actually wrote this down. I don't know if I shared it with you while I was making notes while you're sitting here. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, but are, what are some of the CFP lessons? What are some of the financial planning lessons coming out of the recession? Oh, financial planning lessons coming out of the recession. Oh, well, there's that story that you shared with me when you first said when you first came in about uh, a friend who. Oh right. Uh, their golf memberships not risk. Yeah, I mean, I had a friend, and this it really af- affects us deeply because uh, a close friend, and uh, she had saved approaching 65, couldn't retire yet, really scrimped and saved to finally get to that figure, that asset figure, so that she could retire. And retired finally in January. And then what happened was her portfolio got absolutely decimated, right? And she had a financial planner that probably put her in some great bank stocks, some Enbridge good dividend stocks, and... All that went to Helena handbasket and still hasn't recovered. So now she's at the, she was at the situation. It has recovered somewhat, but her portfolio went from, I don't know, 2 million to 1 million. So she's sort of counting on creating an income of, let's say, 100,000 a year from this portfolio. And now it's only going to produce 50,000. And that's the problem with people like if you have a bad year year in the first five years of retirement, you just can't recover from it. It's not like you can go back to work. It's not like you can save more. It's not like you can even wait for your investments to rebound because you need to live off of them. And I think that's one of the things that financial planners neglect so badly is they're all focusing on accumulation theory, but no one's explaining to them the risk when they finally do retire and how to take that money out and what the impact could be of a bad year, not even just in the first year, but mm-hmm. in any of the first kind of 10 years, it can mm-hmm. just decimate you. Mm-hmm. So it's, and it's been, it's been awful for them. You know, their, their lifestyle was golfing and they have to give up the golf membership and they're looking at moving from, you know, they live in Oshawa and they're looking at moving further up North Bancroft or something like that to, for affordable housing and they'll lose their network, right? Their network were their golf friends, their network was mm-hmm. their, you know, their, their kids are in the area, they're future grandkids are in the area. So it's a, it's a big change in life. It's just so sad. 
you work your whole life to have this, you know, moment when you can retire. And then because of the stock market, it's, it's just decimated. Losing friends, connections, everything. I hate moving. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't Bancroft expensive? Are they going to save anything? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's still, well, I mean, Bancroft waterfront properties, cottage properties would be, yes, very expensive. Yeah. But something more in a subdivision in a town would still be very affordable, would be half the price. Oh, okay. Probably. Okay. Yeah. okay. Where did they go wrong? If you were their financial planner, what? Well, one of the most important things I put in place for people is is wealth insurance, which is, um, you know, whole life permanent cash value insurance. It's an important lever that people can pull in retirement when something goes wrong. I mean, most people are going to be in retirement for 20, 30 years and something will go wrong during that period. Mm -hmm. You are going to experience a stock market crash. You are mm -hmm. going to experience a real estate crash. You are going to experience a period of a high inflation or low inflation and... What the wealth insurance does is, let's say, creates a three to four year buffer that you can live off of and creates tax free income in retirement and allow your investments to rebound. But if you don't have that lever to pull, you are forced to withdraw funds to live off of. Mm -hmm. So what the wealth insurance does is kind of create that buffer. Also, like when you retire, you don't know how long you're going to live. So what are you going to do? You're going to plan to live to 85, but you could live to 100. So what that forces people to do is say, geez, if I live to 100, I can only take out a small portion of my money. If you Google safe withdrawal rate, that's the amount that you know people at age 65 can safely take out of their savings to live off of. And it's only 3 to 4%. It might even be lower at this point. Mm -hmm. So for every million dollars, you're only going to be able to live off of 40,000. Mm -hmm. And that's just not enough. And in people's minds... They're thinking, on average, I'll make around 8%. So I should be able to live off of 80000 But that's not true. You're older. You're going to be more conservative. You want to have some safe money. Well, the safe money now, like 10-year GICs are probably earning less than 1%. Mm -hmm. But at 65, 70, do you want to be 100% equity? Probably not. So use that wealth insurance as your safe money, and you can put the rest in equity, knowing that, when markets are down, you can go to that. And the same applies for real estate investors. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, here in the GTA, we think we're immune from real estate crashes. Mm -hmm. But if you lived anywhere else in Canada, you haven't seen the growth that we've seen. I know. You know, if you live in the States, they've seen major pullbacks like a 2008. Mm -hmm. So, and we're not completely immune from it. And I think this whole COVID thing has probably taught us some of that. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, we could be in a situation 10 years from now where a lot more people are working from home. Mm -hmm. And why do they need to live in the greater Toronto horseshoe? Why can't they be further out? That could hurt our real estate prices. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. our immigration policy changes, that will hurt our real estate prices. I don't see that happening. We need the money. <laughs> we need more but taxpayers. <laughs> where do these immigrants come and land and stay? Uh, Detroit. Because <laughs> we're out of room. <laughs> Believe me, I still believe in the GTA real estate story, mm -hmm. I'm just saying have some other levers to pull. Right, right. So, and it's not beyond it, there being a crash at some point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the asset bubble and whatnot. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, I'm not Kreskin. I can't predict the future. But a smart financial planner mm -hmm. creates a plan that gives you options, mm -hmm. options in, re in retirement. Mm -hmm. So that's why I really impress upon people to get that wealth insurance. It's a, it's a core part of my planning. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of like people in, in our network you know, they're, they are real estate investors, which is like a business, mm -hmm. or they are option traders mm -hmm. and they are funding option accounts. And with these wealth insurance plans, when they're in that wealth building mode, let's say up to age 60, whatever, wealth creation mode, they can still use the, the funds that they put in these insurance policies for wealth creation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have personally bought three properties with our insurance policy and 100% funded our personal trading account with our insurance policies. Okay. So a question about the insurance policies. Yeah. Just from the people that, I'm, that are surrounding me, I find the only people I know who have them, what's the insurance company call it? If the person wants, if the listener wants to go approach their insurance person, is it called Whole Life? Yeah, it's Whole Life. Okay. Permanent there, Cash Value names? Life. Okay. So those are the names that they can, they yeah. can ask people about. Par policies, same thing. 
I've heard there's wrong ones too, but we'll, we'll cover that in a second. I had a friend of mine said she got the wrong one. Universal Life, probably. Oh boy. Okay. So don't get the wrong one, folks. So my observation is the people who have these policies, they're all over 40 and they're all quite, quite well off. Is that wrong? Should people start when they're like 25? Uh, what's the right? Well, I always say that if you don't own whole life, you either can't afford it or you don't understand it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So not everybody can afford whole life. Right. And often 40 is that magical age when you're, you've created more equity in your house and your income has gone up through your job. And so it, it, may, it's a, it's a, it becomes a smart investment strategy to do. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're younger, you've got your first house and your kids are young, you've got daycare, mm-hmm. you still need insurance, but you can't afford all the insurance you need mm-hmm. in terms of permanent insurance. Mm-hmm. So you still go, you might go get term insurance. There's mm-hmm. still a place for term insurance, but just like, I would prefer people to own a house versus right. rent a house. Right. I would prefer to own my insurance versus rent my insurance. Right. So it really depends, you know, where people are on that sort of wealth trajectory and affordability. But mm-hmm. it's a great investment that, and I show people how it saves their retirement and creates twice the income from the same assets. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've talked about a couple of uh, vehicles. We've talked about whole life. What was your term for it? Wealth insurance? Yeah, wealth insurance, whole life insurance, or cash. I like to call it permanent cash value insurance because it's all about the cash value in your in your wealth building years and using it. Okay. So we've talked about real estate. We've talked about what I call stock hacking, stock mm-hmm. options more commonly. And we've talked about wealth or whole life insurance. Okay, so you have a blank slate. You start with a 30-year-old. I'm thinking about the listener. 30-year-old, yep. what do they do first? I, know it's not I think the most important answer. thing for a 30 year old is to get into home ownership. Mm-hmm. And I do think that the stock hacking, the, the courses that, that you run and that you teach will show people a quicker way to build uh, a deposit to be able to buy a house. Mm-hmm. So, but I think it's really important. I think that real estate is going to create long term wealth. And I just don't want people to be kind of stuck in that rental pool for the rest of their lives. I think for a young person, a great, I think you call it house hacking, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you rent a whole house and rent out a room to get a, to build up the deposit. Maybe you buy a duplex and rent out your basement and that kind of thing. But I think it's really important for the young people to get into home ownership. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the, that the courses that you run is like, it's, it's, it's a life skill. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely a life skill. Mm-hmm. So I think it could help people actually get into home ownership sooner because of with the ability to build a, de- a deposit. Mm-hmm. And rent to rent to own is another way for people to kind of get into home ownership sooner as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's where I would that's where I would start is home ownership. What did you think about the financial markets before you learned about stock hacking? <laughs> I'll be honest, I thought it was a mugs game. <laughs> You know, before I became a, a planner and a licensed planner, and which was 2008, my corporate career had been with insurance companies, but always on the mutual fund side or mutual fund companies on the marketing and sales side. And I just, I just realized like in 2008 that RSPs, mutual funds, they were not helping people get anywhere. That was the sort of the lost decade where you know, 10-year history of the fund was averaging zero. People are not going to be able to retire based on RSPs or mutual fund investments. Mm -hmm. And if you ask people what the best financial decision they've ever made is, they say real estate. So when I became a licensed planner, I actively incorporated the real estate asset class into my financial planning practice because Mm -hmm. I really strongly believed that that was the tool to wealth creation. You know, RSPs are a good savings tool. They're a good tax tool. And I think it's important to have savings. Like if you lose your job, if you have 50000 in an RSP that you can go to, but they are not a wealth creation tool. Absolutely not. I mean, RSPs are based on financial planning accumulation theory, right? The banks say, the plan- the planners say, you know, give me 20000 a year for the next 20 years. We'll invest it, compound, you'll get 8%, and you'll have this pool of money at the end of the day when you retire. But that's not what they're doing with your money. You know, you're giving them 20000 and they're lending out 200000 They're creating 
a business. They're starting mutual fund companies. They have mortgages that they lend out, right? They're creating like a, an economy, economic wealth. So what I'm trying to do with people is help them create an economic wealth. And real estate is one of the easiest, I think, businesses to start for people. It's a you know, relatively low initial investment. It doesn't require a skill set, like a major skill set. Like we're not starting a software development company, right? We're just owning real estate and renting it out. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's one of the best businesses that people, you know, can start. So I was very anti-stock market, very Mm -hmm. anti-mutual funds. I just thought it was a mugs game. I didn't know how to win at the game. Mm -hmm. And I was really against it until, well, quite frankly, until you introduced me to the, the stock hacking courses. And just to just to finish your point on the uh, how real estate is a great small business, you know, one of the things that all business businesses want is recurring revenue, right? And that's our rent. Absolutely. I mean, the best <laughs> businesses are are those that have yeah, absolutely recurring revenue. That's why mm-hmm. utilities do so well, or mm-hmm. like uh, Rogers. You know, you're just paying that fee year after year, month after month, and Netflix recurring sure. revenue. 407. Like, oh, yeah. They're good. Yeah. And for anyone who doesn't believe us, like, just look at the stocks who have recurring revenue, like a monthly right. subscription. They all do better. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember, because we both follow Apple, I believe, as a stock. Yep. When they announced considering doing a monthly subscription for their hardware, you pay a monthly fee, you get a new phone every, I don't know how many how many years. After like two years, of, for example, you get a new phone, you just pay a monthly subscription for it, the stock jumped. <laughs> yeah, and not just the, just for the phone, all the apps, like oh, the yeah. subscription for the, for the apps yeah. that they have. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's why, you know, in my opinion, Apple has been a, a huge success. I mean, yes, it has amazing products and, and services, but it's that, yeah, that renewable income. Mm-hmm. Predictable. Predictable. Who doesn't want a predictable renewable. income? Right, exactly. That's why people stay in their jobs. Yeah. They want a predictable income. Yep, yep. We invest in real estate to we have pretty predictable rent. Yep. And if they don't pay rent, I think we know what happens. <laughs> so when you first heard about stock hacking, you're I'm sure you're skeptical. I think we should cover that because almost everyone's skeptical unless but well, you're a pro. So you you got you already understood at least the the mechanics and the, and the theory. I completely understood the the mechanics and the theory. I mean, when I was in my twenties, I actually had an options license. <laughs> so I know what a put is, what a call is. Um, what a bid ask is. I know, you know, I, I learned quickly what Delta was. Uh-huh. And so like the mechanics of it, I understood. I just couldn't figure out how to win the game. Right, right. Right. So it was really kind of the introduction to selling puts on stocks that you're willing to own. And if you get assigned, then selling calls on them. And it's just kind of, I don't know if you want to call it renting out your your stocks and things like that. Yeah, well, you don't and, even own the stock, though. <laughs> no, right, right, right. I mean, and it was all about putting the probabilities in your favor. There's a, not to get into too much of the weeds, but there's a measurement called delta. So if you go into a 30 delta, there's like a 30% chance that you will have to buy the stock. Mm-hmm. So maybe you're cover, comfortable with 30, maybe you're comfortable with a 90% mm-hmm. chance, mm-hmm. Or, sorry, a 10% chance that you have to buy the stock. You can play with that. But if you put the odds in your favor, then I, I guess I kind of figured out a way to win the game. And having an insurance background too, you see most people buy puts, they buy calls because what they're doing is buying insurance. Mm-hmm. But if we're selling insurance, which mm-hmm. is what selling puts and selling calls is, and there's a only a 10% chance that we would have to own the stock, then we're really putting the probabilities in our favor. Mm-hmm. And... That's, I think, the way that we're winning at the game. Mm-hmm. Just like the insurance companies kind of win at this game. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely. We collect these premiums and there's, I mean, over time, if you're doing, if you're doing a hundred trade mm-hmm. trades, not in at a 10 delta, then 90% of the time you're going to win, 10% of the times you won't. But again, as you grow as a trader, you learn to cut your losses quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a it's a really a, a life skill, and it's been a game changer for me. I am fifty four, so I'm sort of entering that pre retirement, and I'm more income focused. 
So for me, options was a, was really a game changer. I have a, a very decent real estate portfolio. I've kept it. It creates good long-term wealth, but I'm less focused on creating more long-term wealth and more focused on creating income for retirement. I know, I mean, kudos to you, Erwin. How many people have you introduced that have been able to quote unquote, retire or quit their job or do that kind of thing. I still love what I do, but this is a def, I'm not going to say it's allowed me to retire because I, I don't really want or need to retire, but it's changed the game for me mm-hmm. for sure. And it's created greater income. So I'm less focused on certain things and, and I, I, I like, I like it. I really do like it. Mm-hmm. Well, you were able to make a lifestyle choice absolutely. recently because of this extra income. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I took this extra income, part of the extra income I've been making, and uh, I've rented I've rented a place for three months in Collingwood. I used to be a big skier. I miss that lifestyle. I miss that active lifestyle. And this stock hacking has given me the funds and the ability to kind of get back into that this thing that I missed and take care of my health more so and mm-hmm. be more active. Maybe yeah, outdoors. Yeah, yeah, be outdoors, right? And what else can you do like in COVID? And and I love skiing and I miss that part. But we have a cottage and we snowmobile, so that's sort of our weekends. But I mean, to rent a just to pay six thousand dollars just to be able to ski two days a week, mm-hmm. I guess it's a bit luxurious, but it's it's giving me a little bit luxurious. Yeah. A little <laughs> bit luxurious. But I mean, I just really looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can still trade from Collingwood. I can still, I can trade from the ski hill. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I can still earn a living, right? Isn't so, it crazy? It is crazy. It yeah. is crazy. It's been very good to me. And I'm very grateful for you introducing me to it. And I mean, it, I've introduced others to it and it, it's just really growing. I'm excited about, you're going to be running another course in March and mm-hmm. I, I want to make it part of my newsletter and help to get the word out, right? Because I am, I should mention this, like I am not, I'm not securities licensed. Nope, neither am I. Folks, right? neither, yeah, so we're I, not experts, folks. We're not licensed to talk about advice. This is well, just sharing yeah. experience. I mean, I can give <laughs> financial planning advice, but I can't give like stock advice. Yeah. So in order, f- this is the same thing. Like I couldn't ethically invest people in mutual funds when I was buying real estate. Mm-hmm. Well, I people can't, do though. I know lots of people who do. Yeah, but I can't ethically <laughs> convince people to, to, you know, to do mutual funds when I'm doing the stock hacking. So mm-hmm. I think I I have to share the course, get the word out, and get people to take it because mm-hmm. I think it will it will be a game changer. But they need it. Like I said, there's they cannot get to retirement. Very few people can get to a real retirement without lowering their standard of living mm-hmm. on RSPs alone. Mm-hmm. They just can't. So we were discussing before we were recording, this has been a special year. Can you, can you share what your returns have been this year so far and what do you, what do you expect going forward? Because actually a lot of people are asking, are asking that question. I think you've seen it. People are like wondering, like, what are you guys budgeting for next year? I mean, I know a lot of uh, people in your network have been like just killing it. Like oh, some people are just destroying it. Yeah. I mean, that is not me. I'm just going to come out and say like I am been – Consistently earning a three to four percent a month, which is still a stellar return. But I mean, I mean, I'm hearing stories of people earning ten percent a month, right? Yeah. But I really feel like, and this has been a stellar year, right? Because most of my, I put additional money to work after yeah. the crash, so yeah. this has been a stellar year. Yeah. But I feel, after March was ideal. Yeah, <laughs> but I feel very confident about uh, employing trading plan that can achieve easily. Two to four percent a month. So if I average three percent a month, thirty six percent, I feel like I'll be able to to achieve that. But actually, let's back that up. So, yep. like we like we mentioned, there's actually quite a number of people who've doubled their money this year. Yep. So even if they only make two percent a month next year, yeah, compared to the year before, that's actually four <laughs> percent. Right. Right. So that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know, like five years ago, if I told you I can show you something to make you comfortably make twenty percent a year. You tell me I'm full of shit. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I mean, and that's cash. This is cash, folks. Yeah, which is different than real estate. Like you different can't, you estate. can't 
eat equity, right? Nope. Real estate is can easily achieve, like a good duplex can easily achieve a 20% rate of return as well, mm-hmm. but it's you can't eat it, right? Mm-hmm. So you still have to have some sort of source of income or job mm-hmm. or whatever, right? So, or you're selling your properties, in which case- you Kill them the golden goose. Right. right. So, but um, yeah, it's a great compliment to it. I mean, mm-hmm. and everybody needs to look at their own financial situation and decide- where their focus is, is their focus cash flow or is their focus long-term appreciation or is mm-hmm. it a combination of both? But regardless of where you are, I think this is a, a life skill. Mm-hmm. And you know, people like we have a lot of same friends yeah. in, the, in the community. Like what's this meant to them? And actually a better question is, do you know anyone who like really needed it? I'll, I'll give an example. So someone I know has enormous uh, medical bills. Um, right. Prescription medication bills. Yep. Because he's um, immunocompromised. He's a, yep. he's a cancer survivor. So he's actually making enough doing this to cover that drug tab. Yeah, that's right, that's that's amazing. That's that's ridiculous. Because his yeah. drug tab is almost five figures. Right. I can't say that I do know anybody that really needed it. Right, right. Um, I tend to be an advisor that works in the good to great. I take people that are doing well and right. kind of catapult them yeah. because they have money to do things. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I no, know and there's to hire you and stuff. Yeah, but I do. I do know some people. <laughs> I mean, I've, I I do know some people. Even some people that work for you that has been game changing, right? Where they were in minimum wage jobs and now they're able to create basically create the same income from from what they were making with the minimum wage job. Mm-hmm. I've started to manage a portfolio for my sister, mm-hmm. and I think that will it will be game changing for her. Mm-hmm. We got her a rental property uh, two or three years ago, and it's it's been doing fabulous as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it is. It's created financial security for her that she just never would have ha- had. She was uh, divorced. I don't know, seven years now, something like that, and. She really worried about what her future was going to look like mm. because, you know, marriage, they might have been retiring at 50, whereas separated, she was looking at age 65. I think she'll still work, but she's got a lot more financial security. So she would be the one, I think, that it will do the most for within my circle anyway. Right. And this is the same sister with a pension? Yeah. Yeah. But... Yeah, she works for the town, but she didn't start working full time till after the divorce, right? Oh, so, okay, got it. Yeah. So she started. She got into it late. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've mentioned it before on the show. But I think it's a pretty well known statistic. Uh, you can correct me because I think I'm a little fuzzy on the numbers. If you don't, if you do not have a pension, I think the number is almost sixty percent of Canadians will never won't be able to afford retirement. Yeah, I don't know what the exact number is. I hundred percent think that. Yeah, you might even be underestimating it. Because again, it's like what I said in the the beginning or earlier, nobody's focusing on what happens at 65, right? You've gone to the top of the mountain with, you have this money, but how do you take it out? Mm -hmm. And if you're that person that has all their money invested in, in a, either in real estate or in stocks and you have a bad year Mm -hmm. in the first couple of years, because you're completely on the hook for your investment performance, whereas people with pensions are not. Mm-hmm. They, you know, a, defi- a defined benefit pension. If you have a defined contribution pension, again, you're completely relying on, and all the, you know, all the organizations are moving away from defined benefit to defined contribution because they don't want to bear the investment risk. You know, in the '80s, like our parents had decent pensions; they were guaranteed, and they had maybe a little bit of personal savings. Now it's the reverse. We might have some OAS and some CPP, but we're completely responsible for that financial security. So I have a lot of doom and gloom questions. (laughs) Oh, dear. (laughs) (laughs) Because honestly, if we're not, if we don't discuss it, I think we're doing a disservice to people. Yeah. Because I already, already think these things, I actually messaged you about these things as well. I forget where, over what medium, Um, but we're talking about, you know, there's the government's running a giant a historically high deficit yeah i don't know how it compares to world war ii but i'm gonna guess it's bigger <laughs> yeah i saw a graph the other day canada was one of the worst yeah. in terms of printing money yeah worst and, and again uh i just think the it's an interesting analogy to compare to world war ii because you know yep. and then and it's actually funny as uh 
been going down this rabbit hole of Bitcoin and, and right. fiat currencies. And the, the, the argument was almost as if, if we didn't have fiat currencies, how could you ever fight a war? Because you couldn't pay for it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so anyways, so the question that was running through my head is, has been for a while is, uh, and I had the wrong answers to it, but at least I was asking the questions. Um, at least I think I had the wrong answers. The question is, at what point, where is the end of printing money? Is there an end? And I don't believe there is an end. And this is, this is why, this is my thought process anyway. We've got all of this, this debt and we've already printed all of this money. Um, but if we stop printing money, the economy would come to a screeching halt and we would have a deflationary environment where mm-hmm. nobody's buying anything because they think that, you know, the dollars are being devaluated and. Nobody wants to do any austerity measures, right? Like mm-hmm. there's two ways to solve well, this explain, problem. Explain for the listener what austerity measures are. Well, basically, so the government's printed all this money and have huge amounts of debt. Mm-hmm. So austerity measures mean they come back to people and they say, okay, we got to pay this back. So we got, we've got to tax you more. So higher income tax, higher sales tax, higher property tax. We all need to uh, tighten the belts and save more and not spend. But nobody, nobody is voting for that politician. People do not want to do that, nope. right? Absolutely not. And even though it could be a smart thing if it was done well, I mean, if it was done drastically and brought the economy to its screeching halt, it'd be horrible. But even though we should be more fiscally responsible and we need to pay back this massive bill of spending that we've done, nobody wants that. So the more acceptable way is to have a high, higher inflation, right? So the dollar gets devalued. So all these people, like sen- seniors, for instance, their savings is worth less because what they can purchase with it is a lot more expensive. Bread's more expensive. Rent's more expensive. Gas is more expensive. Real estate's more expensive. Real estate, absolutely. Stocks are more expensive. Yep, everything. <laughs> but that's the way to do it slowly without people realizing that it's hitting them. So austerity measures never work and devaluing the dollar works. And now you're, the government is paying back that debt with devalued dollars. That's one of the reasons why I love real estate, right? If I buy a property for 500000 and my mortgage is 400000 fast forward, let's say 10 years. Now my property is worth a million bucks, but my debt, even if I never paid it down, is still only 400 So I'm paying back my debt with deflated dollars. That house is the same house. It's It might even be purchasing power, not have changed any, but the debt. And that's why I've been a big proponent of, of using debt. Mm-hmm. And the governments are doing it and we should follow because savers will be losers because their, their dollars will be devaluated. But another opinion, mm-hmm. which I am not in agreement with, but I'm just going to voice it because I'm hearing more and more about it and I absolutely could be wrong, is they're talking about a deflationary environment, right? Mm-hmm. A deflationary environment, we've got all this these technological advances. I mean, maybe we won't own cars in the future. Maybe we'll, there'll be self-driving vehicles and we'll just order it up. And so that would might be cheaper. So we might be in a deflationary environment where actually things cost cheaper. I mean, everything from technology-wise, right? Computers, uh, TVs, microphones, earpods, all that stuff has been going down in price, right? So it's possible that we could have a deflationary environment, which is never any good because you don't want to buy that car this month because if you wait X month, it'll be cheaper and it'll right. be cheaper again. So nobody buys anything. The economies don't. They save. Yeah. And then they save. Yeah. yeah, Which is bad for the economy. It's horrible for the economy. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe that governments will allow any sort of deflationary environment to run for any significant period Mm -hmm. of time because of it. Mm -hmm. And then with digital currency. Right. They'll know if you're saving. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I am not. I I don't own any Bitcoin yet. I don't know if I'm the the only only, only one that person you know that doesn't own it but i you won't even trade it never mind i mean i'm interested i just don't i haven't spent enough time to know and understand it Mm -hmm. and i figure for me i have enough debt that if the dollar gets devalued i'm okay right because i have assets so but 
I get the cryptocurrency mm-hmm. appeal. I get the appeal of it because, yeah, the dollar is being devalued. Any gold and silver? I have traded some gold and silver, not successfully. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, I like the idea of go- I went to gold as this sort of inflation hedge. But I think sort of what happened in the time period that I purchased it Mm -hmm. was people were instead going to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I think there's an argument that Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, whatever currency it is, is replacing gold as that inflation hedge. So Mm -hmm. I've never quite understood why gold was that replacement. Mm -hmm. Uh, Personally, I like real estate as the inflation hedge, real assets as the inflation hedge, even real like real stocks, right? That produce things have... Mm -hmm. Recurring revenue, mm-hmm. I think that those are good inflation hedges. Even like the whole life insurance we talked about is a great inflation hedge. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing about real estate is it's for the passive investor that they'll do. Let's take Bitcoin, crypto as an mm-hmm. other equation. For the passive investor uh, who wants to hedge the inflation, then they'll do gold, silver. Yeah. Right? Because real estate, even though it's somewhat passive, it's still a bit active. Right. Uh, some people don't want to ever deal with the tenant, so they will never do these sorts of investments. But yeah. And it's a self-liquidating asset, right. which is why the majority of real estate investors have way more real estate than they have precious metals. Yeah. And then to explain self-liquidating for the for the listener, it's, it means the tenant's paying off our mortgage. <laughs> yeah. Right? Versus you buy gold, it doesn't produce any income. No. No right? dividend, nothing. No nothing. So I'm not... It's an insurance plan. That's how I think of it. Right. 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 Just as an insurance hedge. But again, you know, like a lot of people talk about having... Five percent of your your portfolio and something like that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's nice to have options, mm-hmm. different levers to pull. Mm-hmm. Not everything's going to be at the top at the same time. Right, totally agree. So we've I've asked you this question before, but because we've doubled our listeners from about six people to twelve people, so they probably <laughs> haven't heard this list, this this before. Uh, I know, I know, half of them called you because <laughs> 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 I don't even know what the right answer is. What is the right mix? So I've I've mentioned it a couple of times on the show about Tiger Twenty One. You're familiar with Tiger Twenty One? A little bit. Yeah. It's a network or a membership yep. of really rich people with right. ten million investable assets. Right. And how I find it interesting is they publish about quarterly uh, a survey of their members what their asset mix is. So yep. in order, it's real estate. Yep. And then after that's public equities, and then after that's private equities. Mm-hmm. And those three together are, I think. I think seventy five percent or close to seventy five percent, right? Of their of that's how they, that's the asset mix of the portfolio. Mm-hmm. So you know eighty twenty. We don't need to yep. care. We don't need to go beyond seventy five percent. Really, if you have a client in front of you, what is the right mix? Like for myself, I'm extremely heavily real estate. <laughs> As am I. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's the whole thing: is it diversification or diversification? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. If you know and understand. Uh, real estate duplexes, the, the GT market. Um, there's nothing. Abs- there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's an asset that's leveraged. So if it grows over time, you get that kind of compounding growth. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a business that's easy to start. Again, I just private equity. I think you need a different skill set for. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to analyze these businesses. I think that they mm-hmm. are. Riskier. What was the one that you said in between? You said public equities. Public equities. Yes. Yeah. So like an Embridge or Rogers. Or, yes. So stocks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, uh, like I said, uh, the stock market. I've always felt it was a mugs game until I my eyes were opened up with this uh, stock hacker skill set. But it just it just really depends on where people are too. I just think like the younger you are, the more focused you should be on long term wealth. And you should probably keep your job and that income. But as you get older, you're done with working for a corporation. You're done with two weeks holidays. Mm-hmm. You're done with, and they're done with you. They're done with paying for your dental plan and your prescription plan. And and uh, if you, know, you have a pension, you, yeah, you want time. <laughs> yeah, you want. So they don't want to pay want, for that pension. <laughs> yeah, you want time off work. And you want to travel, and you want to, you know. So I think you have to kind of create more income. Otherwise, I mm-hmm. mean. Every year you get older, you should have a greater percentage of your income coming from passive, uh, not even passive, but not as much from employment, Mm -hmm. right? I have this argument with my husband sometimes, you know, like, oh, I got a raise. It was only 2%. I said, don't worry about it, honey. Don't worry. I got you. Is that what you said? Well, no, no, but like... (laughs) Why worry about 2%? Worry about your investments because that's what's really creating 
the wealth. We yeah. don't, what do we care if we get 2% or 3%? What is yeah. that, a pat on the shoulder that we've done a good job? Yeah. Inflation. You, know. you just don't want to be at the mercy of your employer. That's the key. Mm -hmm. So every year, a greater percentage of our income comes from our investments. Passive is the wrong word. Investments is the, is mm -hmm. the, is the, is the better word. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned on the show, I know you don't listen to the show. You're, you're not one of the 16 people. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just, I'm, well, it's, the your, it's, it's, it's your fault. Listen. You got me into the stock hacking. I listen to CNBC nonstop and I don't have time for podcasts, but uh, I want to listen to Chris Lewis's podcast. I, have to I heard it was a good one. one. Yeah. I heard it was a good one. That was actually a really popular one. I think 15 people listened to it. <laughs> Maybe twenty. Maybe Seriously, 20. you're joking. What's your membership now? It's it's not a, a membership. This is all your, free. I mean, not your membership, but what's your audience number it's, now? It's, it's like, doubled. To yeah, what? I don't know. It could be twenty five. Uh, but no. So when just to clarify, when I say private equity, I told you before we were recording. Like I do some. I, I do private equities in uh, apartment buildings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and real estate developments, and they're all within the golden horseshoe. Right. <laughs> So, so, you're, there's, so you're my, there's my diversification. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it's what you know, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty comfortable with this stuff. There's, look, there is always better investments. I mean, there's I know. probably better investments, probably real, better real estate investments in the States for cash flow, yeah. right? Who knows? But does it really matter if you make 20% versus 15 or 30 versus 50, of course, it would be nicer to make the larger amount. Mm -hmm. But if you're moving in the right direction and mm -hmm. you're comfortable with your risk tolerance and mm -hmm. and doing good things and creating, like I said in the beginning, creating economic wealth, not mm -hmm. just accumulating accumulation theory, mm -hmm. economic theory. As in like growing what you're accumulating. Yeah. Creating businesses, taking your money and multiplying, taking your money and lending it out, right? Taking your $100,000 and buying a property and boring the rest and creating mm -hmm. that or, mm -hmm. or selling puts on stocks like Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, like mm -hmm. things that you know, Apple, uh, that kind of thing. Not so, advice, folks, which is just stuff we're already doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> These are our personal opinions and stuff that we're actually doing. We're not advising anything. No, absolutely not. I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not like the guru stock picker. Yeah. I mean, I pick the stocks, uh, starting to learn how to read charts a little bit more. But I mean, I got my first Apple phone two years ago. And I mean, Apple's just, Apple's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Microsoft isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world just couldn't even operate computers without oh, it, right? Boy, so, yeah. and they have, there's another company with great reoccurring revenue, right? Every year they... Microsoft 360, I have it. Every year. Yeah, every year. $300 and yeah. I pay it. There's no option not to pay it. Can't operate without it. Yeah. So. And then free, and, no, people could say, oh, just go to Google. Well, no, I pay them too. <laughs> <laughs> Every month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who don't I pay? Zoom, I pay them too. Yeah. Man, my Zoom bill went up like almost 10 times <laughs> when the pandemic started. <laughs> did it really? Yeah. but I, Oh, you bought more subscriptions. Yeah, yeah. I had to do okay. I had to add so much stuff to it and they're good at taking my money too. <laughs> I was using a different um, software, but everybody just was so much more comfortable with Zoom that I switched to Zoom. I know. So. That's the funny thing about now it. Now I'm losing money on my Zoom stock though. <laughs> I mm -hmm. bought it too high when it was too high. It happens. It happens. So you actually mentioned employer. Like you mentioned, you've mentioned employer a couple of times. And, and it was always, it was always in the back of my mind that uh, I think you and I both believe in having multiple streams of income. Yep. I don't think anyone listens to this show would believe that employment income will get them rich. Because I don't think that's why they'd be, they wouldn't be listening to this show if they thought, just work a job, collect my pension, I'm good. I don't know. I, there's a lot of people that think that. And I think as they start to listen to your show, maybe they start to change their mind or their, their eyes become open to other options. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people that just believe that their employers will provide for them. You know, like my husband is one of them. Really? Yeah. Like they he knows just, you though. I know, but they, he thinks differently, right? He, his first few jobs wait, were- wait, wait, wait. He thinks they, different than you? Oh, yes. You have all these licenses. Yes, I know. Well, opposites <laughs> attract, right? But he, his, most of his employment background was through a union, uh -huh. right? And then let, let's say he changed jobs. I remember he changed jobs at one point and his benefits moved from 100% uh, drug coverage to 80% drug coverage. And he just 
thought that was devastating. Like, how could they do that? And I'm like, covering your medication is not their their job, their responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. People need to be responsible for yourselves. Yeah, but and he just they people think differently because you know always kind of had exposure to that union environment. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a bigger deal in the states, right? Like reviewing yeah. your health insurance plan is a big part of your job offer. In the yes, states, right? I imagine it is, and uh, yeah, the medical situation in the U.S. is. We won't go into that. Yeah, <laughs> the, the the thing that I don't like about I just want to mention one thing that I. The problem is, is that if you get sick, you often lose your job because you can't work because you're sick. And then now you've lost your benefits as well, right? I think we are we don't realize how blessed we are to be in, in, in Canada. So, I think I've had enough immigrants on this show to hopefully folks get a taste of that, how nice it is to be here. Yeah. I had a police officer on here just not, not long, long ago. And as much flack as they get, you know, you know, it's nice to be Canadian because the people you're policing aren't completely armed to the nine. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told my cousins, for example, like we're, they're criticizing police in the States. And I said, how much would you have to be paid to do that job? There's no number you could give me to do that job. Is that a well-paid job in the States? No, I don't even no, know. Because no. I know teachers are paid horribly in the States yeah. compared to Canada. Yeah. How much would you have to be paid to do that job? Yeah. Like yeah. it's just a different world there gun-wise too. I can tell you a funny story. I'll be quick. Um, so I was down visiting a friend in Florida, gated golf community. It was Wednesday. They had a quilting group. So I went and then we went for lunch afterwards. And then this woman says, oh my God, I left my purse in the quilting room. And everyone's like, don't worry. It's locked. She goes, yeah, but I left my gun in there. And I was like, oh my God, who the heck brings their gun to the quilting? Could be dangerous. To the quilting group in a gated community. That's how they live. I can't even fathom to understand it. Well, yeah. Wow. Which is, again, like how nice it is to live here. None of my cop friends carry their weapons with them. No. They leave it at work. They don't even bring it home with them. No. Yeah, I know. It's really different to live here. <laughs> They're in a gated community, so it's already guarded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't even want to be a police officer in Canada. I still think that they put up with a lot. But in yeah. the States, I can't even imagine. Yeah, it's, none of it's easy. Oh, uh, one of the things we were talking about before we were recording is we were talking about employment just now. Yep. Uh, we're talking, we're, well, at least I brought it up. Like AI is going to replace a whole bunch of jobs. I think what people are quite familiar with it already is self-driving vehicles. There's all sorts of things. And I don't even think we can see it coming. Yeah. The, the jobs that exist today, so many of them won't even exist. Mm-hmm. I, I tell people all the time, like if you think about when you went on a vacation to Europe with your family 20 years ago, you know, you went with a family, you, you drove to the mall, you went into the, the tourist agency, you got the books out, you looked at all the book pamphlets and you got your appointment with the travel agent and she booked the, the call and then you arrived at the airport early to try and get a window seat and you lined up and you, with your luggage. And, but now we go online and we book it ourselves. So uh, like a tourist agent, that job is completely disappearing. We do, our, we, we print our own baggage tags. We, we check in ourselves. We do everything. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of jobs that are just going to be non-existent. I don't think a mortgage brokerage job, broker job will exist in the future. I don't even, like maybe even real estate agent won't exist in the future. Mm-hmm. Maybe they'll just be some, like a, kind of like a notary type of safety person that will bring you into a house, right? So mm-hmm. there's going to be all sorts of things. I heard I'm going to even- love to sit at home and collect CERB. <laughs> You think CERB will be around, do you? Um, Just keep printing. <laughs> yeah. There's so Sorry. many jobs. I heard, I heard that 80% of carpentry jobs will be eliminated. Like, it's possible that they'll be prefab homes. So maybe mm-hmm. even builders. They won't need as many builders. Mm-hmm. Robots we, we, building houses. Yeah, like, we can't even fathom. Like, we might not buy cars in the future, right? Mm-hmm. We might have self-driving vehicles that we, that we wouldn't even own. Yeah, self-driving Ubers. Yeah. Like, what do I need a car for? And truckers. We were talking earlier about truckers, yeah. right? So if they're self-driving trucks, they're, they're not just not going to need the drivers for mm-hmm. them. So mm-hmm. that career could totally go by the wayside mm-hmm. as well. So many jobs that'll just disappear. And I I fear for what that means from, a, from an economy and mm-hmm. wealth growing. Mm-hmm. I just think that that whole, um, that gap, the wealth getting wealthier, the poor getting poorer, mm-hmm. is just going to widen. And now with the stay-at-home whole kick yep i'm sure there's employers uh if the job doesn't require someone to come into the office yep then when they're going to hire 
they're going to cast a larger net. Absolutely. To anyone who doesn't have to come in the office, which is basically the entire world. Absolutely. Right? Anyone with the phone and an internet connection can apply for that job. Right. So. See, I mean, that government job with the pension is not looking so bad. No. <laughs> but even I think they'll they'll probably come around to it too, right? Yes. Yeah, but true. why are they paying, you know, someone $50,000 who's living in uh, Pickering when they could pay someone $30,000 who lives in North Bay to do that same mm-hmm. function. Mm-hmm. So incomes could really drop, really mm-hmm. drop. Mm-hmm. And we're not trying to scare people, folks. I'm more, my, I think both of our objective is just so people get off your butts and earn some I'm trying to scare them. incomes. <laughs> no, serious. I'm trying to scare them. I actually think they need to be scared about what their future will hold right. if they don't take action. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm seriously concerned for people. And life will be a lot different. I mean, why wouldn't wealthier people, wealthier people will be able to live longer. Mm -hmm. They will be, I I firmly believe that at some point you and I will be able to buy a new set of eyes because the ones that we have are are failing us. Mm -hmm. And, but it's only the wealthy that are going to be able to afford that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So not only do we not have an idea of what the future will hold for jobs, but we have no idea what the future will hold for expenses. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many phones did you have in your house growing up? We had one. <laughs> one. One phone line. Right? Yeah. And So now, internet sucked when you had to dial up and then the phone was tied oh, up. We didn't even ha- – we were pre-internet. Like, we didn't even have internet. Fax machine. Right? No, we were pre-fax machine growing up. There was one phone. And the there was have one, no idea what there we're talking about. One t- there was one TV, right? Now every person in the house probably has two TVs if you yeah. count their computer and their yeah. phone and the actual TV, maybe yeah. three. Everybody has a phone. I think the average is five connected devices in a home. Yeah. As in five devices in your home are connected to the But internet. that's an expense that we never envisioned having. Yeah. And as a planner, how do you – how do you plan for all those future expenses? Mm-hmm. And all you can do is try and create a plan with the greatest amount of wealth and the mm-hmm. greatest to give yourself the greatest amount of options. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I had a I had a senior home person come on the show before, and I was asking about because I hadn't really thought about it. Because when I go on senior care, I'd like you know I'd like country club, you mm-hmm. know, beach resort style, yep, retirement home. So what's that cost? It's going to be a lot. <laughs> Yeah, they say you should just book a, a cruise and just stay on the just cruise stay on the ship. Cruise? That's not bad. Free idea. medical, free food. Someone cleans your room every day. Yeah, don't have to cook. Don't have to cook. Yeah, it's not the worst either to figure that out. <laughs> Do you, you ever done a financial financial plan for that? For, you must have thought of it for the cruise line. Yeah. No, no, I have not. I've heard. Okay, people. folks, if you want, if you want one, <laughs> contact Kathleen and she'll create one for you. I'm sure. 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 We need to figure that out. How to, how to live on a cruise ship? <laughs> yeah. For your, for 20 years? Sure. Okay. Just make sure the ports have internet. that like you can get excess internet from your phone. But yeah. we can probably just get Elon Musk's satellite phone by then. So we can trade while in the middle of the friggin' ocean. Oh, you still can trade in the middle of the ocean now. It's slower. I want Elon's connection. Oh, do you? Okay. You know, to, this, you know, to Elon's satellite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It, obviously, it's a little more difficult because the satellite has to be pointing at you and you're in the middle of the ocean. So the satellite's not exactly pointing to many people. Right. <laughs> Elon will figure something out. He'll have a broad net. Broad. <laughs> Elon's going to save the world. Well, I, I, th- I think it was Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger, who's uh, Warren Buffett's business partner. Yep. I think he said that Elon's got the he's got the cure for cancer. That's what, that's how you justify the stock price. <laughs> oh, boy. Where did we go? <laughs> We always go off on a tangent. There's just so many interesting things. Kathleen, so thank you so much for doing this. I always like to give my guests the final word. So as in like something, whatever you want to share with no direction from me, what do people need to be doing out there? I'll end with this. Uh, I'll talk about this picture I saw, these words of wisdom I saw on Facebook the other day. And it said, a fitness instructor can't make you lose weight. A dietitian can't make you eat better, and a planner can't make you wealthy. You have to take your own action. You have to be responsible. So I really would encourage people to to get out there and learn as much as they can Mm -hmm. about the options that are out there. And I think you have a great venue for kickstarting people into real estate, kickstarting people into options, 
kickstarting people into self-employment and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think that that's going to be the key, but you have to be responsible for yourself. Mm -hmm. So you have to take the action. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Kathleen. So I, I didn't want the last word, but I wanted to share something with you. Yes. I saw this post on Facebook and the objective was to say, well, be kind to one another. Yes. But the, the analogy it was using was, you know, we're in this together. Yes. Right. That's been like the slogan for the pandemic, but the post alluded to, uh, we're all in the same body of water, for example. Like you boat, you boat, yep. right? And now what boat are you on? Right. Some people are in a rowboat. Some people are on a life raft. Some people just have a life preserver. That's so true. And some people are on a yacht. So true. We're in the same body of water. Right. Which, which vessel are you in? Right. Right. So crazy, huh? Dark. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Here you are being the pessimist. I'm thinking I'm gunning for the, you know, maybe not the yacht, but, you know, something comfortable. <laughs> Very good. Good words of wisdom. Oh, and then where can folks follow up? You know, because I'm going to, I'm sure there's people I want to know about the uh, retire on a cruise ship plan. <laughs> <laughs> sure. My website is, it's wealthcoach.ca. I, I just launched a new website. That's why. I didn't know that. Yeah. I launched a new website, got a new URL, kind of rebranded. Uh, uh-huh. I've got some really great content on there that I think helps people look at their financial uh-huh. picture in a different light. So, Can you put up the cruise ship? plan soon soon <laughs> sure know. okay between between okay. you, know, you said you only ski twice project. a week a week is five because <laughs> you're you're snowmobiling two days of the week you're skiing two days of the week so there's some days in there too. lots of time right right i know and you're trying to retire and at the advanced age no that's not no i'm not saying it's an advanced age but many people would love to have your lifestyle at your age is what i mean <laughs> yes we, i've been very fortunate right. for sure mm-hmm. pretty cool so your old website's no good no, it redirects. Oh, uh, okay. It redirects. And then social media, TikTok, Snapchat? Not TikTok or Snapchat. I'm not that cool. Yeah, I have a, a Facebook group, Money Matters, Wealth Talk. Is that two groups? No. Um, it's it's either one. Again, it redirects. So I think the URL is Money Matters, but it's Wealth Talk. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, my email address is... Oh, are we sharing emails? This is for business, so you're okay? It's a business email. Okay. Just so you're warned. <laughs> Because more than 25 people listen to this show. <laughs> no, you're scaring me. Uh, well, my email's on my website anyway. But okay. uh, yeah, vws at live.ca. Okay. I'm definitely not going to give my phone number now. You're scaring me. Because I think we're over 32 or somewhere, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> if not, we're going to stop these shows. <laughs> all right, Kathleen, thank you again for doing this. And you came all the way across town for this. Yeah. I've got, uh, I'm making the most of my Oakville trip. So, but it was nice to see your office and see your people. And th- I appreciate the lunch. <laughs> yeah, grab a cookie on your way out. Sure. I don't even know where they came from. <laughs> <laughs> Before you go, if you're interested in learning more about an alternative means of cash flowing like hundreds of other real estate investors have already, then sign up for my newsletter and you'll learn of the next free demonstration webinar I'll be delivering on the subject of stock hacking. It's a much improved demonstration over the one that I gave to my cousin Chubby at Thanksgiving dinner in 2019. He now averages 1% cash flow per week and he's a musician by trade. As a real estate investor myself, I got into real estate for the cash flow, but with the rising costs to operate a rental business, it's just just not the same as it was five to 10 years ago when I started. Never forget that cash flow reduces your risk. The more you have, the more lumps you can absorb. And if you have none or limited cash flow, you're going to be paying out of your pocket, like I did on a recent basement flood at my student rental in St. Catharines, Ontario. If you're interested in learning more, register for free for my newsletter at www.truthaboutrealestateinvesting.ca. Enter your name and email address on the right side. We'll include in the newsletter when we announce our next free stock hacker demonstration. Find out for yourself what so many real estate investors are doing to diversify and increase our cash flow. And if you can't tell, I love teaching and sharing this stuff.